In 2373, the same year that the Dominion War would start, the Borg again invaded the Federation. The Battle of Sector 001 is worthy of note for two different reasons. First, it's how the Federation would take similar losses to what we saw in the Battle of Wolf 359, but due to the tactics that Starfleet was using, they would still be able to fight the Borg in a protracted fight. The second would be due to the victory of Starfleet by damage inflicted upon the Borg ship, and not because of a flaw to subvert the Borg and their programming found at the last minute. Before we really delve into the combat, though, like all battle breakdowns, let's take a look at the ships that were in the battle itself. If you don't wish to have a technical breakdown, feel free to jump to the timestamp below, but you'll be missing a lot of very interesting stuff. From what I can see and what I've read, the Borg cube that fought in Sector 001 is similar to that of the cube that fought in Wolf 359. With the exception of the secondary sphere vessel and some continuity gaffes, I've been given no reason to believe that, from a tactical standpoint, this cube is any different. The armaments of a standard Borg cube include its primary weapon, which is a tractor beam. While not seeming to be that vital, the Borg's tractor beam is deadly. It has the ability to lock onto a ship even with its shields up. It then drains the shields within seconds. The tractor beam will hold a ship in place and either destroy it, hold it for assimilation, or utilize its secondary weapon, a laser cutting beam. The beam can be used to cut any part of the ship to either remove sections or destroy it outright. The Borg also have a complement of missiles that are specifically designed to drain the shields and keep them down. We also see secondary missiles that can be used to destroy the ship straight out. For defensive systems, that can be a bit tricky. In Wolf 359, we know that the Borg did not use shields. However, this apparently changes in Voyager, which is occurring at the same time as this battle. Since we don't observe the shields being used, I'm comfortable with saying that this Borg cube has the same defensive systems we saw at Wolf 359. This means that the ship didn't have shields, but rather a subspace electromagnetic field. This was a very interesting defensive weapon as the first volley of an oncoming attack would not be repelled. The ship would take the full damage, but the fields would then modulate and adapt to the attacking weapon, making those weapons useless. The ship also used dispersal fields that would disrupt sensors and transporter functions. Also, while I will not be breaking down both the ships of Wolf 359 and then the ships in this battle, I'll be happy to do so if there's enough interest at a later time. But still, keep in mind, the ships at the Battle of Sector 001 were built or retrofitted right before or during the Dominion War. These ships are built to fight. You should juxtapose that against the ships that were made mainly for exploration. Ships at Wolf 359 included a Constitution class ship and variants thereof. There were very few modern ships. So let's juxtapose that against the ships of Sector 001. The ships of Sector 001 were made as combat ships first, science ships second. The ships of Wolf 359 are opposite that. But let's go ahead and take a look at what the Federation brought to the table. For this fight, the Federation at least fielded 30 ships, which included three Oberth class ships, yeah, Oberth class again, two Miranda class ships, five Saber class ships, three Akira class ships, three Norway class ships, six Steamrunner starships, two Nebula class ships, one Soyuz class ship, one Defiant class ship, and one Sovereign class ship. And then, apparently some random unknown ship though to be fair i'd rather be on that unknown ship than on an oberth so you know you had that going for you the admiral had also called for reinforcements so it's possible we would have seen more let's break these classes down note all ships have the current year shield technology for their class unless otherwise stated i'm not going to repeat the shield layouts over and over and over again they are effectively the same. So taking a look at the classes themselves, the Oberth class starship, even though being commissioned in the 2280s, was still inferior to a Klingon bird of prey. Any Klingon bird of prey. Its defensive measures included two forward phaser banks. Moving right along. The Miranda class starship had a bit more punch to it, including six dual phaser banks located on the primary hull, three mounted on top and three mounted on bottom of the saucer section. It also had two single phaser emitters mounted just beneath the impulse engines. It also had the roll bar that contained two tubular phaser emitters on each side. There were six variants of the Miranda class, and the Dominion War variants, which had started to be produced even now, had even more phasers and more torpedo tubes. The Saber class, including the USS Jaeger, would have four Type 10 phaser emitters and two photon torpedo launchers. 
The best ship of the fleet would be, of course, the Acura class, which included the USS Thunderchild. The Acura class boasted six Type 10 phaser emitters and two photon torpedo launchers. An interesting piece of trivia here is that the Acura was to have a weapon that would strike one enemy ship and then volley to the next, getting stronger as it did. Supposedly, we were going to see that in the movie. This was written out due to budgetary constraints, unfortunately. The Norway class ship, including the USS Budapest, had six Type 10 phaser emitters and two photon torpedo launchers. The Steamrunner class, which included the USS Appalachia, had in canon four Type 10 phaser emitters and two photon torpedo launchers. We also see this ship in several different games having long range tri cobalt weapons, but it's never been observed in canon. The Nebula class starship, which, if not the Dominion War variant, was quite close to the Dominion War variant, boasted 11 to 12 Type 10 phaser banks. Three torpedo launchers with up to 450 torpedoes. This was not your Phoenix variant ship, and it was a beast. The Soyuz class, including the USS Bozeman, well, we don't have a lot of technical layouts on this ship, but it's said to be based on the Miranda, so it may at least boast up to six dual phasers and two torpedo launchers. Thanks, Berman. The Defiant class, including the USS Defiant, boasted advanced technology including four phaser cannons, which were generally stronger than your standard phasers, located above and below the nacelle root attachments on the main body. It also had at least three standard phaser emitters. Also, the deflector system could be retrofitted in a pinch to add an additional phaser bank. The Defiant had a total of six torpedo launchers with four forward and two aft. The ship was capable of both firing quantum torpedoes and photon torpedoes. The USS Defiant also had a blade of armor which would rapidly dissipate energy weapons. This would allow the ship to take a harder beating than most other ships even twice its size. As a note, I have seen some commentary stating that it's not clear if the blade of armor was special to the USS Defiant or was standard on the Defiant class. So take that as you will. And the final ship to arrive late was the Sovereign class ship. The USS Enterprise 1701E, the Sovereign class ship, had 12 phaser rays at key locations on the ship's hull. It also had four torpedo launchers, as well as one quantum torpedo launcher. I seem to remember this ship having a blade of armor as well, but at no point do I see that listed on any cannon resource, so I may have just been going crazy. Also, the Sovereign class did have a refit, giving it both more phaser arrays and torpedo launchers, but I see no evidence to believe the Enterprise was a refit model at this time. As I stated, we do know there may have been more ships and Starfleet was supposedly sending reinforcements, so this was just the first stand for the Federation. Let's take a look at their tactics. Let me take a moment to say that the Borg in First Contact are not the same as the Borg at Wolf 359. The Borg here do appear to have some weaknesses and even continuity gaffes that their 359 counterparts didn't have. I'll attempt to point them out as we discuss. Unlike Wolf 359, Starfleet did not send its ships in two or three picket lines at a time to attack the cube. And, unlike Wolf 359, the battle was also broadcast on a secure Starfleet channel, that frequency being 1486. So now you can win at Jeopardy if that ever comes up. In this battle, I believe Starfleet had set up defensive perimeters and fallback locations. Some of the reasons I believe this come from context clues in First Contact itself. We know that the fleet would be meeting at the Typhon Sector. Data states that to get where the fleet would be, it would take over three hours. The Enterprise is ordered to the neutral zone, however, away from the battle. After the battle begins, Jean-Luc Picard disobeys his orders and the Enterprise enters into warp and arrives there at the end of the battle itself. First, let me say that if you find canon that contradicts this, please feel free to let me know in the comments. But taking a look at it, it would seem that they had four to five different perimeters and defensive positions. I think it is unlikely that the Borg were just sitting in one spot for three hours or moving at a slow pace for that matter. It makes more sense that the Borg would hit a perimeter at warp 9, stop, fight, and then continue on, getting slowed down in the process. When the Borg hit the outer perimeter at warp 9, they gave their standard, we are the Borg greeting. You can even hear over the frequency when they recall the USS Defiant. While there were some ships there that were on par with the Dominion War variant Nebula class, it would seem that the outer perimeters had weaker ships. And because of this, what you think would happen, happened. The first and second defensive perimeters shattered almost instantly, though they did cause minimal damage before pulling back. The ships of these perimeters would do what they could and then fall back themselves. This isn't actually as stupid as it sounds, though I would disagree had I been in an Oberth class ship. Consider this. The Borg had adapted to the technology of the days of Wolf 359. Most likely, they haven't adapted to any of the newer technology that the Federation had created. So, you set your ships with known technologies at the first two perimeters. You do what damage you can, and you fall back. 
Admittedly, this won't do a lot, but at least you've done some damage so that when you hit with the weapons you know will hurt them, it's all the more devastating. This will, unfortunately, cost the lives of people and ships that may have better survived when fighting with the newer tech ships, but it would also increase the chances of losing the battle altogether. So during the fight, the first perimeter, and most likely the next three, are all breached with heavy casualties. However, the strategy did allow other ships to stay in the fight, unlike Wolf 359. Starfleet appeared to have a fighting chance. Finally, the Borg have reached the last perimeter and all of the ships with actual teeth are engaged in combat. The plan, tactically, apparently has worked as the Borg cube has taken massive damage to its outer hull. Indeed, while the Borg cube is still in operation, the battle gives the impression Starfleet will have a good chance of winning, even if it's just a Pyrrhic victory. You can also see that, unlike going in rows of two and three, they swarm the ship, which makes a lot of sense. It would be harder for the Borg to fight ships that are swarming it than if they come in a line. This tactic would be vital in winning. Now, if I can take a moment, a lot of people have given the Defiant a lot of misery over the fact we see it disabled in a drift. However, I don't think they take into account the fact that we see the Defiant in the final perimeter still fighting up until the arrival of the Sovereign class ship. We know that the Defiant was ordered back at least twice, meaning it had fought at two perimeters before this. The Defiant was never meant to be a one-ship kill. I sincerely believe they were meant to hunt in packs. If you had, let's say, 10 Defiant-class ships, I think the battle would have went a lot different. However, regardless of where you fall on the Defiant, at the end of the battle, the USS Enterprise 1701E enters into the fight. The Sovereign-class ship takes the brunt of a lot of the attacks and, given that it just entered, does very well. Captain Jean-Luc Picard takes command of the fleet and orders them to attack what appears to be a non-vital system. This is where I begin to have issues with the movie. First, I can buy that the Federation created technology that may be harder to adapt to. I also can buy this technology inflicted heavy damage on the Borg cube. However, what I find an issue is that the Borg never had generalized systems. One of the things that made the Borg so ominous is that they had redundancy upon redundancy. You couldn't just lock onto one system and destroy it on a Borg ship. The ship was one system. That's what made it dangerous. You couldn't target weapons, engines, or life support. Every part of the ship was effectively that. So targeting a non-vital system means the Borg fundamentally changed the way they operated and regressed. They moved away from perfection. It's not logical. Now, if I'm being generous, maybe Data misspoke and stated this as a way to confer that the redundancy being targeted had not taken as much damage. Perhaps he meant to say there were other parts of the cube that were far more damaged and that would be prime targets, but that's stretching it. Either way, with the ships firing in one specific spot, the cube is destroyed and a sphere exits as a means of escape. The Enterprise begins a pursuit course, and I'm sure many of the other ships do as well, though are too far behind to really catch up. Bob's your uncle, Mary's your aunt, now we're into first contact, which is outside the scope of this video. Many have asked if the Enterprise had not shown up, would Starfleet have won? Based on what we get from the movie, I believe so. I think that the reinforcements were either on the way, or we did have the base and Utopia Planitia, which were being upgraded for defense against the Dominion. I do believe that, if not for the deus ex machina of the Enterprise and Picard being able to spy on the Borg, that they would have incurred deaths into the hundreds of thousands, but still, the Federation would have won. In the next generation, you saw science ships that doubled as military ships. I sincerely believe that in First Contact you saw warships that doubled as science ships. And because of that, it may have saved all of their lives. Hey guys, you probably got to see how some new effects work today. This was brought to you in part by some of my patrons. If you aren't a patron, please consider going to patreon.com forward slash lore reloaded and becoming one for as low as a dollar a month. It really helps me out and allows me to continue to buy new and improved assets to ensure no content ID and keeping a quality product. If you haven't already, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. And guys, I'm going to see you on the next Lore Reloaded.